Hey, we are live in Yukon, Oklahoma. Welcome back. We are, uh, this will be uh, probably less than 16, I think, if you're following along up in YouTube. And um, we are going to be, uh, today, we're, we've already finished the armor. Now what we're spending a little bit of time on the uh, battle strategy or something that we can learn from battles in the Bible. And then we also, uh, next week, we will uh, be our last talk on the armor series, and it will be a strategic overview of everything we've done and also uh, some continued spiritual warfare lessons learned. But in this particular case, we're going to be, um, let me get this so it's working. There we go. We are going to study only one battle out of the Bible because we don't have time to study. I have a list of 127 <laughs> biblical battles. We're going to study just one. And the reason for this, we oftentimes wonder, why is the story in the Bible? What is this all about? And I want you to get this sense that everything in the Bible is there on purpose. Mm -hmm. Everything. Every word is on purpose. And we need to recognize that there are some things about the battles in the Bible that God wants us to learn some spiritual uh, information from it, but also how do we apply it nowadays in our lives? And so uh, we, uh, the battle we're going to talk about is the battle of Siddim, uh, which is the very first battle that's listed in the Bible. That's in Genesis chapter 14. So let me get my Bible out here. Let's all go to Genesis chapter 14. And let's see here. I'll move that away. It's going to make a little noise for people that are recording. But Genesis chapter 14. This is an interesting situation. Um, there is this king. He's a... Uh, th th these kings are from the north, and actually they're from Mesopotamia. And... They, um, this particular king represents the Elamites, and his name is Shador Laomer. He has uh, subdued all the tribes in the northern areas, and he's subdued all the tribes around the Jordan River Plain area, and um, he's been in charge of them for 12 years. They've been, what that means is they've been paying tribute to him, taxes to this guy, all right? And after 12 years, uh, the, the southern cities, five of them rebelled against him. They were done. They didn't want to pay him anymore. And so they revolted against him. And in response, he, along with three other kings, started an attack against uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and some other cities. All right, let me pick that up. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Put the sword away so Curtis doesn't have an accident. <laughs> I have a tendency when I'm talking to pull things out and start talking with them in my hand. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and go into chapter 14 here. And um, this is also, not only is it called the Battle of Sedem, Sedem means the sea salt or salt sea. It's like it's the Dead Sea area. So not only does it mean that, but also this is called the Battle of the Nine Kings. So we were just talking a moment ago before class started about the Hobbit. The Hobbit battle is the battle of the five armies. This is the battle of the nine armies, the nine kings, okay? And um, so what I want us to see here is we start with verse one. Mine actually is labeled Abram rescues Lot, all right? So... In the days of, and then let me give you these names here. We have Am Raphael. He's the king of Shadar. We have Erak, the king of Elisar. We have Chador Laomer. He's the king of Elam. And we have Tidal, who's the king of Goam, which actually means the king of nations. So I wanted you to see right off the bat, these kings, their names have meaning. When you're, when you're reading the Bible, let's see here. When you're reading the Bible, 
you might want to get yourself one of these handy lamp dandy little books like I have. This little book here is called A Dictionary of the Scripture's Proper Names, How to Pronounce Them and What Do They Mean. Okay, that's a little tiny book. I love it. So we'll pass it around, let you see it. That way those who want it can get a, oh wait, look, they have, they have put a, something over the top of that so you can't even see what the ISBN number is. Doesn't that suck when, <laughs> yeah, so you'll take a picture of the front and go searching for it. But we'll pass this around. And so as I'm reading the Bible, I, when I come across names, I pause. I pause because I recognize there's a reason why God put those names in there. And maybe if I can put them into my language, they have meaning to me. But it's sure that they do. And Raphael, it means he is the speaker of darkness. Ariok means he's like a lion. Shador Lamer, he's the one that's the main king. His name is handful of sheaves, like a bound up wheat. He's also known as the binder. So the, the uh, handful of sheaves means he's the wealthy one among all these guys. And then we have title. He means, his name means cast out of the most high. Yeah. So every one of these guys are now giving you some insight to the story. These are the bad kings from the north. And their names give you some insight. So if you were reading this in Hebrew, and you come across this story, you would not be reading names like Am Raphael. You'd be reading, and the speaker of darkness is the king of Shinar. And of course, then you might go and look up what Shinar was also. I'm only giving you some of it. I'm not giving you all of it. All right? But right off the bat, I'm getting a whole different sense about this battle. This battle is one that has uh, some really, really bad people. And I'm going to show you how bad they are. Because these people are, they were the best of the best kings and warriors and armies in that day. They all came from Babylon. So all their names are Hebrew names of Babylonian names. So the first one here, Anne Raphael. You may know him better as Hammurabi. The code of Hammurabi? Yeah. yeah, Hammurabi. That's this guy. He's in this battle. It's like, wow, really? Yeah. So as you start to go through these stories, there's a lot of interesting tie-ins back to other uh, Gentile histories. So let's see about the good guys which we would not call them good guys because of Sodom and Gomorrah, all right? <laughs> but the, we go a little bit further in the story, and it says that the five kings from the Valley of Jordan, these are Bera, the king of Sodom. We have Bersha, the king of Gomorrah. We have Shinab, the king of Adam, or Adma. We have Shimadur, the king of Zeboi, and Zorah, the king of Bala. Okay, now their names have meaning too. Oh my gosh. Bera, the king of Sodom, is called the evil one. So now we're getting a whole other story. We're finding out, wait a minute, maybe they're not the good guys. Bersha means wickedness. The wickedness king of Gomorrah. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Shinab says, sin is my father. Now, I kind of wonder about this. Are they their real names, or these are the names that God wants to put on them to represent them in the story? Which is it? Uh, well, we have found out that uh, some of these kings have different names in history. Archaeologists have found that. So they do have different names, but these are the names that are given in the Bible, and we've been able to match up these names with other historical people. So it's not a myth or a fantasy story. These are real people. We have uh, Shemibir, means soaring on high. Kind of like, you know, a Native American name or something. He's the one that's soaring on high. Well, it actually means he's so full of pride that you can't get him down out of the clouds. Okay? <laughs> and then Zora is funny because, you know, if you read this, uh, it says that, 
uh, my version says, and then there's uh, in verse, uh, let me see, verse 2. And then there's um, the king of Bala, that is Zora. And the word Zora means insignificant. This king is so insignificant, his name's not even given to us. Yeah. So here's a case now. We've got four kings to attack the five kings down south. And now we got a little bit more insight into that story. So right off the bat, we can see, spiritually speaking, when we encounter darkness <laughs> and evil, and one side looks good and the other side looks bad, maybe they're both bad. In other words, don't take sides. Look to God for the answer. We, have a, we do that a lot in politics. One side looks better than the other side. Depends on your perspective. But actually, both of them are old sin nature people. Look to God. All right, so anyways, we get a little bit of insight here from these names. Now we'll go a little bit further. So in verses 5 through 7, it says here um, that in the 14th year, Shador Lamer and the kings who were with him, they came and they defeated the following people. So these four kings defeated somebody. I call them the monster slayers. The monster slayers. They slayed the monsters. Let's see what those monsters are. There are six of them. The Raphim, the Zuzi, the Imi, the Horites, the Amakites, and the Amorites. Now, the Raphim, their name, I should have put it in quotations, means walking dead. Oh, that's where they came from. Yeah, the Nephilim, <laughs> the Nephilim in Genesis chapter uh, 6, verse 1 to 2. The Nephilim means also walking dead. Okay, so the Raphim, the Bible classifies them as giants. Let's see here. Oh, I thought I had a list here. No, I don't have my list. I, I left a list at the house. Um, I have a list of all the Bible giants and what tribes there are, the giant tribes. So we have the second one here is called the Zuzim. Their name means ro roving creatures. What? Yeah, they wanted to have terror in everybody's, uh, you know, everywhere they went, they were roving uh, nomad but they're called the roving creatures because they were, uh, they terrorized people. All right. And so the Im, their name also just means terror. So the kings from the north came down, these evil kings, but they're so bad, meaning they're so, you know, terrible in army wise that they can defeat the giants and the, the terror ones. And look, the Horites. Horites, uh, their name means they dwell in caves. So these all along the the, uh, the Jordan River area on, on the east side, the east bank of the Jordan, mountains along there have caves. And these people lived in those caves. And they were terrorizers. They would run down into the valley where the, the towns were, and then they would you know plunder everybody and then run back up into the caves. They were cave dwellers. The, Amor uh, the Amakanites, these people are really bad. Their name means blood lickers. They were cannibals. They were cannibals. In the land of Israel, there were cannibals. We have all kinds of archaeological findings about those people. They were really bad. They would put their children into fire in, and pass them through these rings in, in their worship of Baal. And then when they came out on their side, they'd eat those kids. See, people don't ever talk about that. They talk about the child sacrifices. They don't tell you what happens afterwards. It's horrible. That's why this is not for children, this class, okay? I mean, if you have a youngster, I, I tone it down, but I didn't see anybody small in here uh, that, that could, anybody small in here that couldn't handle it, I said. I was going to finish. Uh, so if you're like a five-year-old, I'm not going to tell you the story of the cannibals. All right. The last one here is the Amorites. Um, their, their name, what? Amalekites. Say it louder. The Amalekites, aren't they the ones that Saul defeated? And got oh, every trouble? single one of these will be in the Bible later also. Yeah, but because I think that's the one that got Saul in trouble. Yeah, well, Saul, you know, 
he goes looking for help from the bad guys. He's, he made a lot of bad decisions. But this last one here, the Amorites, uh, they were giants. And the Bible tells us uh, in Kings that the height of cedars is how they were described. They were, they were tall. So I was thinking about this the other day. I should have put the picture in here. Maybe I'll do it next Sunday. But I have a picture of the world's tallest man in history next to his family and next to uh, some others. And he is like way up there, really tall. And his was caused by a pituitary gland uh, problem. Growth, uh, so growth hormone kept on producing more growth. These giants are uh, genetically... Um, there, there is all kinds of uh, stories in the Bible about them being related back to the fallen ones, the watchers. So we won't get into the watchers right now, but later if we have an opportunity, we will talk about the watchers and, and how they produce the giants or Nephilim on the land. But I want you to see these names because these kings coming down are so bad and their armies are so, uh, so good that they can defeat all of these six different types of, um, let's put it this way. When, when Israel spies saw some of these, they said, they're so big, we're like grasshoppers. We should not try to mess with them. And Moses says, what? And of course, Joshua and Caleb, they said, but God's on our side. We can defeat them. All right. So these are some of those same things. Yes. Right, so there was, uh, the, so the 14th year means this, uh, Shador Lamur had control over them for 12 years. Then those, those, uh, those five cities down on Jordan River Plains area rebelled against him in their 13th year. So they had one year of freedom. And, they, and then he spent that year gathering his forces of the other three kings. And then in that 14th year, they came down to attack. And I'm going to show you a map in a moment here and show you what they what they did. All right. <laughs> you can't see it back there, but you know when this is recorded, you'll be able to uh, pause it and zoom in on it. But let me show you a couple of things here. So um, let's see here. You can't. I can't see. Oh, there. No. When this when this light gets onto that TV set, you can't see it. So I'm sorry. But Upper in the upper part we have the four Shinar, Elam, Elasar, and Goem. Those four king areas come down, and on number one there they enter into the the area where the Jordan River is now coming down. And the Jordan River comes down from um, the you know the Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea. Well, all along the mountain there, there's a there's a there's a um, there's a highway there that they call the King's Highway. The King's Highway on the right here, that blue line on the far right, comes all the way down along that mountain, and that's called the King's Highway. And it gets all the way down into the Dead Sea area, and the Dead Sea area is where you have Sodom and Gomorrah and the other uh, three other cities, okay? So number two, the southern kingdoms, that's where the first battle starts to happen. Okay, and that's what it's representing. So the, the four kings come down, and in number two there, they encounter the, the five cities of, of the Jordan Plains. And what happens there is the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities attack back. They get defeated and routed. And they're, they're actually, uh, sought, the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah ran into the mountains. And on the way to the mountains, that whole area there is uh, littered with tar pits. There's, there's uh, petroleum all in that area there, and tar pits. And the Bible tells us that a whole bunch of the people from Sodom and Gomorrah and, and that battle, they, they fell into the tar pits. So some made it into the mountains, but many of them didn't make it. And so this, this king from the north with his, uh, his allies, the other three kings, they defeated them. Well, they've already, you already know how bad they are. They've already defeated those giants and those, those terrorizers, and now they defeated the, 
the real reason why they were coming down there. Well, what happened when they defeated them is pretty important. Because it says here, let me get to that page. Um, it says here on verse 11. So the enemy took all possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions. And so they took everything Lot had also. But now Lot's involved in this. So now we will know why this battle is important to us. Because Lot was taken as a prisoner of war. All right. So as they continue on south, so at number two, they got Lot, and they take Lot and all his possessions. We have no idea what that means, but it means all of his cattle, all his sheep, everything, all his people that were part of his family, all of his, uh, you know, everything. They took it all as prisoners. So see, in some places, they would have just killed them all. But God has a purpose here. So God's protecting Lot. So they didn't kill Lot. They may want to. We don't know. It doesn't give us that detail. But we do know that Lot's with them. And now notice after two, we come all the way down. When you get to number three here, you're down at the uh, the Gulf of Aqaba in, in modern uh, times. There, that is, there's the ocean comes up to that area. So they turn and they keep going back along the other side. And on the, on the west side, they get to uh, Kadesh Barnea. That's a famous place if you read about it in the Bible. I won't tell you any stories right now, but Kadesh Barnea, very, very important in Bible story. And they get there and they continue on north and they get past number five up there represents where Abram is located at right now in the story. You notice Abram's off to the west side. He's in red now. And the blue, they keep up a long the coast I mean, along the side of the Dead Sea, and they keep going north. Now we pick up the story with Abram. And Abram uh, on verse 13. And then one who escaped came and told Abram of the Hebrew. This is the very first time the word Hebrew is in the Bible. All right. So it says here, <clears throat> He was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and of Aner. So let's see what we got here. First, I want to talk about the tar pits before I get too much farther. Uh, the valley of Sidon was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they fled. Some, some of their people fell into these tar pits. And uh, archaeologists have... Uh, you know, found bones and things that may be related back. So it's always fascinating when you read Bible, archaeolog Bible archaeological journals and what they're finding in the Bible areas. But uh, I don't know if any of you have been to Los Angeles, but the, the, they have a tar pit down there and massive dinosaurs and things that they found inside of that tar pit. Uh, no telling what's inside these, but I wonder if they're having giants in them. Anyways, <laughs> so... Uh, the enemy took all possession of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their provisions. They went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possession. And how did Lot end up in Sodom? Do you guys remember that part of the story? Yeah, so so he, he was very, very, very wealthy. He had a lot of animals. And Abram, his uncle, was very wealthy and had a lot. Of, and they lived comfortably together as nomadic type of people. But they got to the point where they said, hmm, we need to separate. Yeah, the shepherds are not getting along. And so the leaders, Abram and Lot, says, we need to separate. And Abram says, Lot, where would you like to go? Wherever you go, I'll go the opposite direction. Very nice of him. So Lot says here, and Lot then lifted up his eyes, and he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered. And actually, where they're located at, they can see over to the Jordan Valley area. And they can, so they're up on, on an area where they can see quite a bit. The grass is greener over there. Okay? The grass is greener over in the Jordan Valley. So on that map, you showed where Abram was. Or Abram. Yeah. And Lot was on the other side. Those yeah. two houses were massive. Um, 
Yeah, you can see 30 miles in this area over to the other side. And we'll come across something similar to that when we get to the story of Ruth, okay? Because uh, same thing happened there, uh, where they could see from Bethlehem to the other side over uh, to uh, Moab. And the grass was greener over there too. So the grass was greener, all right? It was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord. Hmm. Like the land of Egypt. Hmm. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. This, this is my Bible verses right out of the Bible. I just popped them right in there. In verse uh, chapter 13. And it says, So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east, and Lot settled among the cities of the valley, and he moved his tent as far as to Sodom. So that's how he got involved with the Sodomites. He, he moved there because the grass was greener. All right. So now it's back to the battle again. All right. So all of these soldiers, by the way, from all the kings, uh, from the, the northern kings, they're all professional soldiers. By this time in history, there was a whole classification called professional soldiers. They trained all the time. That's what they, they did for their living. And the armies of all nine kings were well experienced with battles. And although this is the first one being recorded for us, we know that from the Hebrew language there that they all had experience. And Abram then finds out about this. So let's read a little bit about that. It says here um, in verse 13, so we see he's, he's out there visiting his friends. And it says, these were allies of Abram. 14, when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, Lot was taken captive. He led forth his trained men that were born in his house, 318 of them, and he went in pursuit. All right. So we hear about these. I don't know if I could say it in this room. I, I could say it. You, you guys are all adults. Badasses, all right? He went after those badasses, all right? And he says, they have taken my nephew. All right, so he says, I'm in a position now where I can't just sit here and enjoy what I have. My nephew is taken and he's a member of my household and every member of my household is covered by the covenant with God. All right, so there's, a, there's something going on here, the spiritual also. So what does he do? He's, he's so wealthy that he owns his own army. 318 trained soldiers. These are elite. And they were born in his household, in his family, and, and amongst all of his uh, manservants. And they're all part of his family, basically. They're not necessarily genetically his family, but it, born in his household is a vocabulary that means these people are all covered by the covenant. All right, and um, so 318 of them. He doesn't even wait. He doesn't say, oh my gosh, do we have the resources to go against those thousands of others? I didn't tell you how many there were, but uh, they have estimated that there was uh, multiple thousands of soldiers that came from the north. So this, these are big, big battles. And he's gonna take his little tiny small group of 318 men. This reminds us of another story, the story of the 300. Yeah, very similar. Yep, there's, there's no negotiating when you're fighting against evil. Yeah, so he takes this uh, 318, and his force is heavily outnumbered. He uh, has elite trained soldiers, though, with him, like special operations. Oh, that reminds me. I was reading a book this week that I received from a friend of mine who is a special operations guy in the uh, Air Force special operations. And there is a novel, it's not a novel, there's a book out called Special Operations Church. And it's all about, um, you know, how do we get into the, the dark kingdom and recover people and bring them back into the light? We're on special operations. And so this, I thought it was really cool because it's written by a guy who's a special ops guy. So we, all his vocabulary is all about the military vocabulary. 
Well, Abraham here has God on his side. So his soldiers are elite and they have God on their side. All right. So uh, we go a little bit further now. And let's see what happens. It says, verse 14. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and he went in pursuit of them as far as Dan. Let me back that map back up. I should have had a second copy of it here so we can see it. But, so Abram finds out about it and he pursues the blue line, which is those those uh, four kings, he pursues them north all the way till they get to number six up there, which is Dan. Okay? So, quite a ways he's pursuing them. So were the other kings aware he was coming? Well, we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> yeah, were they aware that he was coming was the question. I repeat it so it's on our recording. All right, yeah, to be continued. So let me jump back forward where we were. All right, we got the backing of God now. All right, so after his return from defeating them, so we find out they defeat them. How did he defeat them? Well, take a look at it. In verse 15, and he divided his forces against them, and they attacked by night. It was a night operation. <laughs> night operation. Isn't that when special ops do things? Or when the SWAT guys, uh, you know, coming into a bad area that they have to take down, they don't do it in broad daylight. They come in at, you know, three in the morning or something crazy and pounding on doors. Well, these guys here split their forces up, came from two separate directions, so they were flanking these armies, and in the middle of the night, they attack with only 318 against thousands. Because when you get God on your side, it don't matter what your size is. And when you're trained, okay, he didn't take a bunch of amateurs. He took trained people. All right. So it says here, uh, he and his servants, and they defeated them, and he pursued them all the way to Hobah, north of Damascus. So those four kings are running. They are running away as fast as they can, and he, his, his group is still pursuing them, not relenting, not giving up, going after them. Why? Well, yeah, get maybe get him out of land, but but they have Lot. He's not stopping. He's going after them to get his kinsmen. All right, so he pursues them. And then it says here, and then he brought back all the possessions. So he defeated them and brought back all the possessions. So let's talk a little bit about that. After his return from defeating uh, Shador Lamer and those kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, Remember Bera? I put it in there. Bera, the evil one. The king of Sodom went out to meet uh, Abram at the, at the king's valley. He crawled out. He, crawled out. <laughs> he comes down out of those hills and says, hey, I heard that you won, so I'm going to come and rejoice with you and be a part of the winning team. <laughs> okay? All right? It's kind of like when Saul wants to give his armor to David, so it looks like Saul's in battle. I mean, that's how I interpret that. <laughs> this guy is coming down, says he wants to be a part of the of the, the winner's circle. All right. Well, at that point, we see here, um, he brought back in 16, he brought back all the possessions, also brought back his kinsman Lot with all his possessions and the women and the people that were also captured that belonged to those other cities. He rescued them all, everybody, with 318 all right, so verse 17. So after the, his return from defeating uh, Shador Laamir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high, and he blessed them. Oh, check this out. This is just fascinating. Who in the world is this Melchizedek? We get to study him in our next study because we're going to be doing the 13 people that foreshadow Jesus from the Old Testament. That's our next study. So we're going to go into a lot of detail about Melchizedek. But right now, we'll just give you a brief overview. Uh, he, his name means the king of righteousness. And he's the king of Salem. And Salem means peace. 
and that's Jerusalem. So he's the king of righteousness and peace. Who's that? You know, that's foreshadowing Jesus. And what does he do? He brings bread and wine to celebrate. Wait, no, this is not a celebration. He's coming to bless Abram. God told him, because he, he's a priest of God the Most High. El Elon, that's his name. And that's, that's the name of Yahweh, or Jehovah also. So God the Most High, he is one of his priests. So he's a Gentile, not a Jew. He's a Gentile priest of God. They, they do break wine, they have, I break bread and drink wine in a part of some of their ceremonies and covenants and, and agreements. But in this case, he's not there for that purpose. He tells us he's there to bless Abram. His whole purpose was God said, go bless Abram. So take bread and wine. And he's the priest of the Most High. And then it says, and he blessed him, he blessed Abram, and he said the following. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So it was recognition. Yes, go ahead. That's right. This is the very first time in the Bible that the God Most High, El Elon, is also mentioned. So see, there's a rule in hermeneutics when I'm, when I'm teaching the Bible, and that is, the first time something happens, pay attention because it actually gives you more insight into future things also. So this is the first battle in the Bible. The first time Hebrew is mentioned. The first time God Most High is mentioned. So there are important things happening here. And, um, and so it, it's interesting here because then what does Abram, what, how does Abram respond to the blessing? Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He wasn't told to do that. This is the very first time the word tithe is in the Bible. Another first thing in this battle is tithing. Tithing was the outcome of being blessed by God and your victory over the enemy. He tithed. He gave a tenth of his possession. Oh, this is really important because New Testament teaches us the tithing goes back all the way to this point. This was before the law. This is before Moses and the commandments. This is 400 years before Moses when this happens. So we see here that giving a tenth and offering, it has nothing to do with the law. Has everything to do with the relationship of recognizing your blessing? Yes. Yes. So. Yes. So she's pointing out that it's a tenth of all his possessions. The first time he's given it up, and we'll see here also. Let's see if I have it on my slides there. No. So let me talk about it here out of the Bible. It says here, Abram gave a tenth of everything, and then the king of Sodom. Who is that? The evil one, Bera, right? The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. So all these people are parts of my city. Give them back to me. But all the possessions that you had taken, all the plunder that was taken from the, those bad kings, you can have all of that. So here is the evil one bribing Abram. Okay, that's what it is. It's like, hey, you can have all this. Abram is led by God. What does Abram say? But Abram said to the king of Sodom, you evil one. He said, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. That I, Possessor of heaven and earth means everything is owned by God. Everything. So that I would not take a thread or even a sandal strap or anything that's yours, lest you should say, I am the one that made Abram rich. The evil one wants to take credit. Abram has wisdom here and says, I'm not taking even a strap from your, your, your shoes because then you will say, I became rich because of you. 
but he became rich because of God. He says, I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me because they had food. So he wants the food back. But other than that, don't give them anything. No, no, no plunder. You had something? I, I was thinking he's buying loyalty to you. He's trying to buy friendship. Oh, yeah. So he's trying to you know buy the friendship, buy loyalty. Here's a powerful he, man. I'm going to do what he did with Abram's him. Abram's really powerful, so let's be friends with him. And also, let's make it so he is in, indebted to me. Because, yeah. you know, the Bible says very clearly, the man who gives you the loan, you're the slave to. Okay? So he don't want to be slave to nobody but God. So these are some powerful spiritual warfare strategies also. Let's talk about it. The objective was to free those cities. God's agenda was Abraham to go rescue Lot. And Abram, he's not aligned with any of the five kings from Jordan. He, he's not aligned to Sodom, Gomorrah, and those others. Abram refused to take the plunder. So you're in a spiritual battle and you come out victorious and winner. Don't go taking the spoils from those who you defeated. He could keep his reputation of independence and neutrality. No one can say that the king is who made him rich. And he gave a tithe. The first mention of it here in the Bible to the priests of God. So that's another spiritual lesson. We give back into God's mission and God's people. In this case, that priest is representing that in the city of Salem, the city of peace. All right. So what are some strategies we get out of this? One, you need to form a team. Spiritual battle is not for lone rangers. You're not in this by yourself. You go into battle, you have a team with you. Abram didn't take off by himself. He took his team of trained elite warriors. You need to do the same when you're going into a spiritual battle. You take a team with you. Number two, research. Discover how did the enemy took something that they're not that the, the enemy doesn't own. So in this case, um, he gets a word and he finds out, and he does some research and finds out about these kings. He finds out that they took Lot. He finds out that they're pagans and that they don't uh, you know, worship God. So in, in modern times, you can come across uh, cults, pagans, uh, occultists. Um, you can come across pornography and other areas that have stolen people. There, there are ways that the enemy takes captive your relatives, and even yourself. So be aware of this. Take inventory. Do some research. Understand. Discover how did the enemy get into the camp. Okay? Number three, before you go into battle, you better put on or take up the full armor of God. Don't go into battle thinking you can do it yourself. And, and so go back and review all the parts. Pray them in. Put them on. Take up the full armor of God. Number four, an intercessory prayer shield. Mobilize an intercessory prayer team who will hook their shields together with yours. Don't go into this by yourself. You're, you, need a, you need a group of people who know that when they pray, they can intercede on your behalf and see God's miracles at work in your life. That's what you want. You don't want somebody who's not trained. Now, you may need training yourself. Hook yourself up into an intercessory team and start learning how to pray. We have, starting tomorrow morning here at our church at 6 in the morning, an opportunity for you to come here for the next five days and pray at 6 in the morning and intercede on behalf of many people who need help in our community. And then on Saturday, we'll meet at 8 o'clock. But you have a chance to participate in that. And if you're not able to be here at 6 in the morning, recognize that, hey, God's not bound by distance and time. Pray wherever you are and hook your shields up to all of ours. All right. And number five, seek the Lord on the timing of your advancement and the engagement. Abram did not sit around waiting. He knew the timing was now and he engaged the enemy and went after and pursued him. I believe uh, it's because God said, you going to take care of a lot or not? Well, of course I am. It's going to take off. 
That's just my own interpretation. But uh, recognize that you need to seek the Lord on all your spiritual battles and his timing. When are you to engage? When are you to not? When are you to rest? When are you to look for your margin time, as our pastor has been teaching? And then when do you go back into the prayer? Now, I don't know if you noticed this. I mean, you may not have been there this morning, but Pastor Brian demonstrated the use of the sword of the word of God in prayer. He gave scriptures and prayer examples, just like we went through last week. So we're right in step with our pastor. He is teaching that from the pulpit. We're teaching it from our in-depth study. And we recognize the armor, pray the word of God. And finally, the last thing, make sure that you have a heart of gratitude, thankfulness, and giving and blessing, just like at the end, Melchizedek and Abram, they were able to glorify the Lord. It was not Abram who won the battle. And they, they both recognized that. And they were able to demonstrate to the enemy, to Sodom King, that it's not because you helped. It's because God Almighty is the one who did this. And so we need to have that in our prayer life, gratitude, giving, and blessing. And I close with this uh, really cool scripture. Some Psalms 44. God, we've heard about all the glorious miracles that you've done for our ancestors in days gone by. They told us about the ancient times, how by your power you drove out the ungodly nations from this land, crushing all their strongholds and giving the land to us. Now the people of Israel cover the land from one end to the other, all because of your grace and power. Our forefathers didn't win the battles by their own strength or their own skill or strategy, but it was through the shining forth of your radiant presence and the display of your mighty power. You loved to give them victory, for you took great delight in that or in them. So Psalm 44 is an encouragement to us that we can learn from these examples and in our own lives, he will shine forth. So I hope that uh, the study was beneficial to you. Any questions before we close? Did I really, I talked 100 miles an hour. Uh, this, this is um, 400 years before Moses, so it'd be about the, um, I'm trying to calculate. Um, I think it'd be about uh, 2,000 years before Jesus. Yes. Yes, he had already developed because he died in this battle. He died in this battle. So Hammurabi had already developed his code, and he told us also where he got his code. He got his code from one of his false gods, but it was a it was a code of justice. No, uh, Babylonian Empire, uh, there, there are multiple histories of Babylon. So this is um, after um, you have the Tower of Babel. This is after that. So, you know, that also was a part of the Babylonian, because that's in Babylon area. So there's a lot of history there. And I can, I can provide to you a chart that has historically all the dates for this battle and all the people. I think that'd be easier than me trying to remember it because personally, I just, I skipped past memorizing that chart, but I have it. All right. Father, thank you for this uh, study we've done today. We thank you, Lord, that we can learn even the battles in the Bible have spiritual meaning and purpose for us. Down to the individual names, even, we can learn from that. So we thank you, God, that everything in your word is powerful and it is useful and it won't return to you void. But may you be uplifted by this study. And this week, may we be remembering that you fight the battles. We put on the armor and stand. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.